Hi, I'm Ting Ting Luo from the Australian Institute of International Affairs National Office. Today joining us is Dr Nicholas Waru from the University of New South Wales, Canberra to talk about Indonesian politics, religious influence as well as civil military relations. Thank you for joining us, Doctor. You're welcome. Um, if I could start by asking you to describe the internal affairs landscape in Indonesia, particularly how the government is performing as well as how President Joko Widodo is performing in his role. Uh, well, thanks for the, uh, for the question. Uh, if you're asking me about the contemporary uh, car, uh, internal affairs uh, landscape of Indonesia, I think we should uh, link it with the issue of the process of democracy in Indonesia that has been uh, taking place since 1998. So how many years? It's over 15 years now, right? Mm. Uh, and of course, it's a, a quite a you know bumpy you know process uh, in order to democratize the country uh, after the over 32 years of. Uh, uh, living under the authoritarian uh, rule, but one thing that I'd like to highlight is that the you know people, the population is now uh, uh, starting to become uh, you know more confident actually uh, in 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 the, in, the, in the government, and I mean that's quite a, a, a significant issue because in the past uh, people were sort of you know they did not really have confidence in the, in, in the government, so that's why they tended to uh, do things in an informal way, if you like. But uh, now the government uh, seems to be in charge. Right. Uh, the, the other uh, progress that has been uh, made by uh, President Joko Widodo he, is that uh, he, he, he really tackled the issue of the bureaucracy uh, at the grassroots level. So some people might be uh, critical to, uh, to his performance in this way because they think well, this is not the, the level of the president to tackle the issue at the very bottom level at the, at the local you know, governmental office. But that's what uh, uh, Joko Widodo uh, has, been, has been doing. Try to make sure that things, I mean the bureaucracy and his administration works fairly well and also uh, uh, you know, serve uh, the people well. And that's what uh, I think what's uh, his uh, commitment. Uh, in becoming a president uh, in, in this term. Okay. Yeah. So what do you see as the main issues in Indonesia's attempt to balance pluralism within its internal affairs? Well, uh, the condition of uh, religious uh, and ethnic pluralism in Indonesia has, uh, has been uh, uh, steady you know, you know, uh, for uh, four decades, if you like. All right. There were some conflicts here and there, but uh, in terms of the uh, level of tolerance of people to the other peop uh, uh, population from the different religious or ethnic backgrounds has been uh, 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 quite steady. So I'm happy to say that you know there's nothing much changed about that. Uh, the only uh, issue that uh, is quite uh, worrisome uh, to me is that when uh, uh, some groups, you know, with this uh, religious and you know ethnic uh, 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 background try to uh, use this uh, uh, primordial issue, if you like, uh, in politics. So uh, on the on everyday basis, things are quite well, you know, religious tolerance and everything. But when it comes to the uh, let's say the election, you know, the election, uh, presidential election, or the election of the uh, uh, provincial go uh, governor. Or, or local uh, administration, then you know some groups tend to uh, uh, use this uh, uh, issue of religion or uh, ethnic uh, uh, affiliation uh, as you know part of their political campaign. All right, and and that's why most of the conflicts in relation to this uh, uh, issue of pluralism, I would say, happen uh, not at the everyday basis, but probably only during the, the election. And the tension is uh, 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 is quite heightened, actually, and it's quite worrisome. But you know, once the election uh, uh, ends and people uh, return back to their normal uh, daily life, then you know we can see the uh, all this uh, normality of the uh, 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 issue of uh, pluralism in Indonesia. Okay, and we also see that um, the government is trying to make a lot of reforms. And one of the key reforms since the end of the new order has been the military and police reform. 
Um, how do you see the civil military relations in Indonesia progressing? Well, uh, one of the good things from the uh, uh, the end of the authoritarian uh, rule in 1998 and uh, uh, the, the, the coming of the so-called reformacy or reform is that uh, uh, the police force has been uh, uh, separated from the, uh, the, the armed force. That, uh, that, that's one thing. Uh, and for the Indonesian armed force, the separation and also the uh, reform within the military uh, uh, would also uh, help this uh, uh, institution or uh, organization to become more pro professional. They would no longer spend you know, uh, their, their time to uh, uh, look after the domestic issues, just for instance. They would, uh, now they uh, uh, have uh, some sort of you know, privilege to become more professional, uh, uh, try to uh, work as the uh, professional defense force like you know, we know in, in the other uh, modern uh, uh, countries. Uh, 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 so uh, that's 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 a good thing, you know. That, that they're, they're no longer uh, uh, preoccupied with the domestic issues. You know, they want to become uh, more professional and then uh, concern more with the uh, so-called external uh, uh, threat. All right. Uh, On the other hand, the the military also uh, start uh, having a thought uh, about the the importance of the civil society in the process of uh, democracy in Indonesia. They know that uh, uh, there's no way Indonesia can become a democratic uh, country uh, and get the respect uh, uh, at the international level if there is no appreciation to the, uh, to the role of the civil society. Uh, uh, so they, I mean, the, the, the Indonesian armed forces uh, uh, have, uh, have uh, made the civil society organization uh, basically as their you know, partner in the process of reforming the, uh, the TNI, the Defense Force uh, uh, Organization. Uh, however, I would not really highlight the issue within the, the, the military, but uh, rather it is actually the problem within the population, all right, in which that uh, and for, for over 30, 32 years uh, uh, under Suarto, people uh, w were used to see the that the military being at the forefront of every issues. So, uh, you know, military, uh, the, the, the uh, defense organization were really at the uh, so-called the, the, the leader uh, in uh, tackling most of the issue uh, in Indonesia. And people still, uh, I think, is still quite comfortable uh, to have a military figures in uh, uh, many organizations, not just in, in political parties, uh, at least if, uh, if the military uh, figures would not become the, the, the president of the political parties, at least they would be you know, one of the uh, leading members. And, and it will, I think, will boost the confidence of all the, uh, uh, the civilian uh, uh, when they do politics. But you know, I think just recently the, 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 the commander of the Special Force, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, is being nominated to be the uh, the, the head of the uh, Indonesian uh, Soccer Association, you know, and probably uh, four other uh, sport organization. Uh, I mean, this is just, I don't know, this might uh, uh, sound uh, weird uh, to the Australian context, but that's, you know, uh, uh, what that happens in Indonesia. Most of organization, civilian organization, sport organization, cultural organization would like to have a military fig <laughs> figures uh, in, the, in the organization. So, I mean, uh, this is quite a challenge uh, for for the Indonesian armed force, and as I said, there's there's always a temptation for them to return back to, to, to politics and you know uh, again uh, set up the political agenda for the for the nation uh, as we uh, found in the past. See, with the Indonesian Air Force leading the largest military exercise ever within the South China Sea, mm -hmm. where do you see Indonesia in the you know South China Sea debate? Well, as far as I'm concerned, Indonesia does not have a direct border with the South, uh, South China, China Sea. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, so that's why Indonesia is not part of the uh, con conflicting parties over, over this issue. But the agenda for, the, for Indonesia is that to, uh, to show to the uh, uh, countries in the, in the region that uh, uh, it is a sovereign country. All right? And at the ASEAN level, uh, uh, by getting involved or try to uh, solve the conflict in uh, South China Sea, 
that's the way Indonesia tried to show its role as a mediating power uh, in, in the region. The, at least the, uh, the, the uh, Indonesia can show to the to the international community. Look, uh, we can talk with the China, we can talk with the other countries uh, from Southeast Asia and other conflicting parties. We, uh, uh, and at the same time, we don't have any interest with that. So what we want to do is just to mediate or, or settle uh, settle this conflict. And I think that will be a kind of uh, uh, soft power mm. of uh, Indonesia uh, at the uh, at the international uh, uh, diplomacy, at least uh, because Indonesia would like to take a, a leading, once again, to take a, a leading uh, role, at least at the, at the ASEAN level, something that uh, especially during Suharto, Indonesia really, you know, had that kind of position. Well, thank you, Dr. Waru, for your time today. It was very insightful hearing it from an Indonesian's perspective. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Happy to have you.